Hello, and welcome to another episode of Cracking Addiction. My name is Philippe Naren, and I'm joined, as always, by Dr. Fergal Armstrong. In the episode of Cracking Addiction today, we're going to go into a bit more detail about methadone. In the earlier episode we did on methadone, we talked in a lot of detail about the induction of methadone. But in the episode today, we're going to talk a bit more about the pharmacokinetics and the interactions of methadone with other medications and how it interacts with the body. So Fergal, this is a massive topic and we're going to try and squeeze this into one episode, but one could speak for hours on this topic. What do you think the key points for our viewers and listeners should be about methadone and the pharmacokinetics of methadone? So I think it's important that if you forget everything else, it's really important to understand the variability of methadone kinetics, so the inter-individual variability. So the half-life and the behavior of methadone in one person can be significantly different to that of another person at any given dose. And the question then becomes, well, why is that? So if we understand kinetics as a four-step process of understanding absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion, I think we need to go through each of the um, each of these steps in the context of methadone. So first of all, Philippe, and t- what do you think about the absorption of methadone? You talked about individual variability of methadone, and I don't think truer words have been spoken. With regards to the oral bioavailability of methadone, I've seen numbers from between ranges of between 35% to 100%. So that gives us an indication of how different people absorb methadone. We're talking about a 65% variability in some of the numbers that I've seen. I'm sure that reflects your clinical experience and your clinical research as well, Fergal. Would you agree? Absolutely. 35 to 100% is is the, the, the figures in my head. So think about that. Someone on 100 milligrams of methadone a day could really only be absorbing 35 milligrams a day, whereas another person on 100 milligrams a day could be absorbing 100 milligrams. I mean, you know, that's that's frightening. No, as far as I'm concerned, no other drug has got such a variable um, kinetics. I suppose warfarin does as well, but you know, it, it really is impressive. And then we have um, the, the 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 reasons why. Now, then then we have distribution. So first of all, what is the distribution of methadone and what is the protein binding of methadone? So again, it kind of varies a tiny bit because essentially you've got, I've I've seen numbers where there's kind of been like fourfold variability in the amount that's kind of distributed and and free fractions of methadone around 13%. But these numbers are, are hard to kind of compute other than to say that it's, you've got a fourfold dis- difference in how methadone is distributed to the various parts of the body. And I think that's yeah. the number I remember more so than the actual yeah. percentage free in the body. So yeah. again, significant variability in distribution. Significant variability. And bear in mind that methadone is highly lipid soluble. So adiposity, the amount of fat we're carrying in our bodies will also affect the way that methadone will behave in our body. So someone who's uh, obese will over time collect methadone in their uh, adipose tissue. And then when you stop the dose, there'll be a significant long tail of methadone exposure, much longer than you would expect. Um, and of course, we know that uh, methadone, you said free methadone is 13%. Well, that equates to what I understand as the protein binding of methadone was around about 87%. So we know that methadone is highly protein bound to albumin plus various globulins. But again, that protein binding then allows for further kinetic uh, variability. Uh, so, for instance, if you know if we have significant uh, uh, protein loss, then you've got less protein binding. Therefore, you've got higher free methadone levels. And if we have certain inflammatory states, certain inflammatory states actually increase the amount of the proteins that bind methadone, and so that will then reduce the free methadone. Um, you know, so the, the, the inflammatory state of the patient, the adiposity of the patient they can all affect protein binding. And of course, if protein binding is so high, you're talking about high protein binding, then you can have other drugs which then can displace methadone from protein binding sites. So 
there are three reasons why, again, just with that aspect alone, why methadone is so variable. So we've got adiposity, we've got protein binding and the risk of displacement and the risk of changing levels and fluctuations in actual the proteins that do bind methadone. Again, the key word here is variability. What about the metabolism of methadone? What would you say to that? The thing I remember when I was going through training for opioid substitution therapy was to be aware of both fast and slow metabolizers. And methadone is broken down in the liver by CYP450 enzyme. And there basically are some people who will rapidly break down methadone. And there are some people who will break down methadone at a much slower rate. There are also medications that can interact with CYP450, which can have the same effect. So just because we give someone the same dose of methadone doesn't mean it gives us the same effect. We've talked about variability across two other fields. Now this is the third field. The breakdown of methadone is also quite variable and it is very difficult to predict unless you've got the clinical exposure. And the patient is usually the one that tells you because there are no real tests for this. Mm. So we know that uh, you know, CYP breaks down the uh, methadone, but the key question then I suppose, what part of the CYP family? And I always say to people, look, if you can never remember which enzyme breaks down a particular drug in the human body, always go for CYP3A4 because 50% of all drugs are in some way metabolized by 3A4. And the same is true for methadone. So some of it is metabolized by 3A4, but there are other enzymes that metabolize methadone, 2B6, 2D6, 2C19, plus uh, a couple of others. So there, there are multiple enzymes that break down methadone, and therefore for every enzyme that you have breaking methadone down, you also then have a risk of a, a kinetic interaction with either an enzyme inducer or an enzyme inhibitor. So what what's the what's the effect of uh, enzyme inducers and enzyme inhibitors on on CYP function and methadone plasma levels so enzyme inducers unfortunately break down the methadone a lot more quickly and so the patient then will be more at risk of withdrawal whereas enzyme inhibitors have the paradoxical effect of increasing the time taken for methadone to be broken down thereby potentially increasing the risk of toxicity for a patient and buildup of methadone in someone. The classic medications that I remember that were CYP3A4 uh, inducers were phenytoin, carbamazepine, rifampicin. And I think one of the classic CYP3A4 inhibitors is, is fluvoxamine, an antidepressant. And those medications were the main ones that have stuck with me and they're the ones that I focus on. But there are a lot of medications that act on CYP350 uh, and we do need to, sorry, CYP 450, and we do need to be mindful of medication interactions as well. The ones that I've listed are the famous ones, but they're, the list is not exhaustive. There are a lot more medications. Would you say that's fair, Fergal? Uh, the, the, the list of medications in both groups is just enormous. So the key thing to understand about um, these drugs is they, they, they induce or inhibit the enzyme that metabolize, metabolizes methadone. They don't actually inhibit or induce the methadone itself. They have, they have their effect on the enzyme that then metabolizes methadone. And so it's not uncommon to meet people who are on carbamazepine either for epilepsy or chronic pain, chronic neuropathic pain conditions. So when you start carbamazepine or for that matter, any other enzyme inducer, what happens to the plasma level of methadone thalipin? So the plasma level of methadone when we've got an inducer is that it does slowly decrease the plasma level of methadone. So mm. these inducers are acting on the enzymes that affect methadone level, as you mentioned, Fergal. So inducers increase the rate of breakdown of the methadone. Yeah. So you can potentially end up in withdrawal. So when you start an enzyme inducer, that means then that you have to perhaps increase the dose of methadone, right? So you, you need to then go through a period of titration to get the patient stabilized again. So the, so the key risk for the initiation of enzyme inducers is instability and heroin use. Now, that's all well and good, but what happens when you stop an enzyme inducer? What happens when you stop carbamazepine? 
unfortunately, what happens is you've stopped the medication that was more rapidly breaking down the methadone, but then you've subsequently left the patient on the same higher dose of methadone. So that does increase the risk of toxicity unless one also decreases the methadone dose. Yeah. So induction risks uh, or relapse to opioid use, whereas stopping an induction or an inducing medication risks overdose. So it's a really fraught issue and it's really important that people have in their own minds an understanding of enzyme inducers and the effects of enzyme inducers. Um, now the opposite is true when we talk about enzyme inhibitors. So when we inhibit, when we start an enzyme inhibitor, what happens when we to to methadone when we start an enzyme inhibitor? It uh, increases the plasma level of methadone, which then risks opioid overdose, methadone toxicity, respiratory depression, and potentially death. So again, if you're not aware of the potential effect of the of this new drug that you're prescribing on someone's methadone level, you could potentially for want of a better phrase, kill them just because he started a second dose, a second medication without careful consideration of what's going on in the kinetics. And then when you stop an enzyme inhibitor, what happens then? So what happens when we stop the inhibitor is that the plasma levels go down quite rapidly. Yeah. And that, of course, then relapse causes a risk of uh, relapse of methadone. Sorry, relapse of substance use disorder, relapse into opioid use because your levels of, met of methadone have gone down. So again, it's, it's kind of the reverse, the mirror image of what happens when we uh, play around with inducers. But basically, at both points, either the initiation or the cessation of either an enzyme inducer or an enzyme inhibitor, we either risk opioid toxicity or relapse, which are ultimately disastrous for the patient. So unless we have vigilance on this issue, we are potentially walking into a disastrous situation for our patients. Now, that's uh, metabolism. Finally, we have excretion. So tell me about excretion. So methadone is excreted through the kidneys and mm -hmm. the guidelines and research usually say that about 10% of the drug is excreted from the kidneys unchanged. Yeah. And the excretion of methadone from the body is dependent on, on the pH basically. Um, and the numbers are a bit vague, but essentially pH of six is the thing to remember. If the pH is over six, about 4% or, um, is renal excretion. And if the pH is less than six, 30% renal excretion uh, are the numbers that I remember anyway. Does that mm. marry up with what you're yeah. aware of, Fergal? Yeah, so it, it is the, the excretion of the parent molecule is pH dependent, as you said, but it's also, you know, this is an example of how, again, urinary pH. Can you imagine urinary pH affecting dosing? We know, for instance, that alcohol causes an increase in the, um, the unchanged excretion of methadone. So again, you know, you know, we're dealing with people with substance use disorders. It's not uncommon for people with opioid use disorder to binge on alcohol, and that will in and, in and of itself reduce sorry, will increase the excretion of, un of un unmetabolized methadone, which then may affect plasma levels of methadone. So again, this is another example of why it's fraught. Now, I, th I think I should also bear in mind that not only is methadone renally excreted, it's also its metabolites are renally excreted. So the liver metabolizes methadone into two main metabolites, which are inactive, thankfully, and then they're all effectively renally excreted. So we've, we've really seen a significant variability and a significant susceptibility to uh, in, um, polypharmacy as we're discussing the, the, the journey of methadone's kinetics. How would you summarize the overall risks in terms of an understanding of kinetics? I think in summary and something for our Hey, uh, viewers who are, who are watching this and getting quite stressed and worried about all the potential interactions is to tread cautiously. If one is not sure what new medication they're adding to their patient's regimen and how it will impact on methadone, look it up. Look up everything that we're going to give to our patients. If you're not sure, ask someone. There are specialists around. There are textbooks. 
There are medication handbooks. But as long as you can understand the basic principles of methadone, how it is absorbed, how it is broken down, how it is excreted, and you understand the key points in that pathway, any medication that we add or any treatments that we do, as long as we can satisfy that they're not going to interact in key aspects of the methadone absorption, breakdown and excretion, then we can be relatively sure that we are being safe. And I think that's a decent overview to, to have of that. Would you, would you say that's fair, Fergal? Yeah, I, I, I always think of the, the figure 18. So there's an up to an 18-fold variability in plasma concentration of methadone for any given dose of methadone when you compare two individuals. And, you know, we've just gone through the reasons why. So for me, it boils down to the key word variability, susceptibility to change. And I think that just emphasizes you don't know what your patient's going to, how your patient's going to respond to a given dose of methadone. Give it time and be cautious. Excellent. And I think that's a great place to end the episode for today. We've gone through a lot about methadone. Thank you for joining us on this journey and bye for now.